This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, roomies. Did you miss us? Welcome to our first preseason episode of season four. We are all working hard right now building the torturous delight that is coming in this season's rooms. I hope your stomach can handle all of the squishy, torturous delights. (laughs) But don't worry. It won't be long before we welcome you in and make you choose a door. (laughs) Ah, Delightful. But truly, we are pretty excited about this upcoming season. Season four is going to be a lot of fun. But for now, listeners, we hope you enjoy this devilish double feature. Let's get on with the episode. Wake, standing on the doorstep of a beautiful mansion. The front door stands open. You can hear voices, music, so many, many people. You step towards the door. You have to know what's inside. You are lost. You have no memory of how you got here. It doesn't matter. Because now, you belong to the Grey Rooms. Season 4, Pre-Season 1. Fire in the O! (laughs) Well, it was just as satisfying as I thought it would be. (sighs) All right, lads and lasses. You good to go? Remember, not a wall standing this time. All the doors are already loaded out, so it's scorched earth. New management has big plans for the space. <laughs> you got it, boss. You heard of them, you filthy animals. Pack up your axes and slashers and let's get in there. I hate these things, don't you? Oh, that's it. Cordy up! Warden! That's up! Hold on! Look, the lads are getting into something fierce down here. Oh, I can't hear you. Let me get clear and I'll call you back. Hey, it's me. The warden just called us, so I've got a window where they won't notice us talking, yeah. 
I know. I, I wouldn't have called if it weren't important. I, I don't even know how long he's going to let me hang on to this blasted thing. <laughs> he hates pretty well every idea the Admiral's put out on my table so far. So I thought I'd make use of it while I can. No, no, listen, I, I know this is hard for you all to understand, but, but things here are changing every five minutes or so, it seems like. No, not not literally. I, I, like, I still have two bleeding arms. I was talking to a wall sometimes, I swear. The project is at a crossroads, see? The Admiral joining management, Bob in... Well, where Bob is... He sent everything into a tizzy. You know, even the architect seems on edge. <laughs> oh, well, well, look, that's nice of you saying all, but if I'd known what would have happened... I'm saying your great bloody serpents pretty well fucked everything on its ear, that's what I'm saying. And you're out there sending love notes and pocket change while old Todd's in here at the mercy of the warden's blades and chains and such. Okay. Good. Thank you. You'll be in the next drop. Well, that does make me feel a bit better, yeah. You always want to know where the back door is. That's what my dad always said. I marked on those plans I sent over. The best place for an idea hole. Not like we're going to have a forest I can go slipping off into this time. Oh, good. You got them, then. Quite a mindfuck, ain't they? <laughs> Oh, I couldn't believe them when I saw them. I've never done anything like that in here before, I can tell you that. Uh, soon, I think. Yeah, yeah, they're just narrowing down the candidates. Got a lot of good ones this time. I think the Admiral's been helping them so I had the good from the bad. Sure, sure. Yeah, I've got, got lots more to say, but if I don't call him back soon, he's going to come down here. I'll have to explain myself. And, yeah, I ain't going to like that. I'll try to call again soon. Right, bye. Shit, 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 shit. Hello, Todd. Sure. What you doing there, Mr. Mathis? Oh, you just smack gave me an heart attack. That would have been quite the feat, wouldn't it? Still, it would have been nice to see. Well, sorry, sir. I, I was just trying to call you back. Well, one of the lads had, had a couple of questions about the way Miss Alma wanted the garden dug up. I uh, mean, I had to get clear of the construction site, you know, and then it was all... Well, it was all Stop your blubbering, Todd. You're all right. The architect wanted me to use that damn thing. But I'm not really a remote kind of guy, am I? <laughs> I'm more of a hands-in-the-soil kind of manager. Or uh, eye sockets. <laughs> if you say so, sir. Speaking of Miss Alma, how is she getting on? <sighs> I'm assured the work they're doing down at the river is extremely important. <laughs> it's all beyond me, I'm afraid. But the Alienist Lodge wouldn't have entrusted her with her own coven if they didn't believe in the work she was doing. All right, then. Well, just a shame we won't see her around as much. I suppose. I just know it means more fresh faces around here. And you know what I think about new people, Todd. <laughs> yes, sir, I think I do. Uh, uh, what did you want to see, Daniel? Besides the carnage of destruction for its own sake... Besides that, the new blood 
is constantly asking questions. Why do we do it this way? Why do we do it that way? Mortals are insufferable, Todd. I need you back upstairs and in a room with him. Otherwise, at some point, I'm going to pin him down, reach into his mouth, and rip his tongue out so that's dangling from my hand. All pulp and meat and root and blood. <laughs> Plus, someone needs to take notes. And you know technology and I don't get along well. <laughs> Uh, uh, sure. Uh, sure enough, sir. L l l let's get back to it, then. <laughs> Have you, uh, any Admiral, finished the list? Uh, short list for the founder yet? Uh, well, we're still trying to decide who the next guest will be. <laughs> Todd, my boy, I tell you what. Not only are we trying to decide who the next guest will be, we're trying to decide what the next guest will be. Sorry, what? <laughs> you'll see. Oh, you'll see. Yeah, thanks. Actually, make it a double. I'm telling you, Lindsay, there's something fucked up with this town. People are disappearing left and right. The government is in on it. Huh. Yeah, sure. Next you're going to tell me that everyone from Indiana has a hive mind and wants to take over Ohio. Or that one time you told me a robot named Alice was going to harvest your brain for some top-secret government project? Seriously, give me a fucking break. Trust me, the government is harvesting brains. You gotta believe me. Look, I I'll help you in any way I can. But being a walking murder board with news clippings and blurry photos isn't going to convince me. You think the upper class of this town is picking off what they consider the scum of the earth? Okay, sure. But nobody knows where the bodies disappear to. Hardly anyone is looking for them. I feel for those folks, I do. But there's no way you're gonna convince me that ransacking this house is gonna get you what you want. Show me the damn evidence. Some reason to believe you. Or I walk. Here are 10,000 reasons. I'll pay you five up front and the rest after. It'll be an easy job for you. You keep watch, I go in, I come out, easy. Scout's on him. Uh, thanks. Are you telling me that you have $20,000 on you? On this side of town with no idea who could be listening? Have you lost your fucking mind? Yes. Now are you in or are you out? <sighs> Fine, I'll come. But I don't believe your damn conspiracy. I'm only in it for the money. Fine by me. Finish your drink and let's go.
plan was simple. Vincent would go into the house and toss the place while I stood watch. I watched Vincent enter the house through a side door. He did something high-tech with the security, picked a lock or two. I couldn't see what he did, but it seemed very complicated. He slipped inside. I sighed, sitting back in my seat, feeling the whiskey in my system. I was already thinking about the debts I'd clear with my payout for this job. I was about ready to turn on the radio again when I saw a face in the window upstairs. All I got was a quick glimpse before they turned away. Shit. No one was supposed to be inside, and I had no way of warning him. I'd have to go inside. The house had seen better days. From the faded yellow walls to the dirty blue carpet, it reminded me of my childhood home. The house was silent. I gave a quick glance around the foyer and couldn't find anyone. Where the hell was Vincent? Even after ducking up the stairway and searching the entire second floor, I couldn't find him. I cursed to myself. I knew this place felt off. I should have never taken Vincent up on his offer. I needed to get out of here, so I made my way back towards the front door. My skin was crawling. I was trying to retrace my steps to the exit when I felt a sharp pain at the back of my head. (sighs) My vision blurred as I felt the carpet under my feet welcome my slumping body. I woke up, alone, bound to a chair. (laughs) The walls were paneled with wood. Dim lamplight casts dark shadows. Experimentally, I pulled and struggled at my bindings until pain lanced through the back of my head from my wound. My wrists began to ache. After a moment, my eyes adjusted. I looked at the room around me. I was able to make out an array of bookshelves lining the walls and a pair of wine bottles that sat on a small table across the room. Uh, Hey! Is someone out there? Hello? Can you hear me? In response, one of the bookcases in front of me slid open. A woman in a sharp black dress walked towards me. She held a mostly empty wine glass, tilting it and swirling what little remnants were left in the glass. It smelled like Merlot. That's the kind of details I notice. Oh... Look who's finally awake. Good evening. I'm so glad you didn't keep me waiting. I was afraid you'd be a delicate flower. Who the hell are you? No one important. You're much more interesting. Your pockets had so much to say. Your ID, old and faded, cracked, almost expired. A Weston Lane's bowling punch card. Just three more visits till a free round. Oh, yes. And $5,000 in cash. A fascinating story. Much like the last 
bull that went through my shop. I seriously hope there's more to you, because if not, I might have to retire early. Seriously? Who the hell are you? My customers call me Cleo. And based on this driver's license, you were Lindsay Calloway. However, from now on, you're cattle. To do with as I see fit. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, the only cattle I see is the cow right in front of me. <laughs> I hate damaging the merchandise. It's just bad for business. People always demand a lower rate for used goods, and they claim fear hormones ruin the taste. Ah, uh, well, some of my clients tell me that, but I think it's hogwash. The money's all the same to me. Let's shut that mouth of yours. All out of witty quips? Good cattle. Never disobey the butcher, especially when she is trying to enjoy her wine. Follow that, and you won't have much to fear. Not for now, anyway. Mm. I would love to stay and chat, but I've got clients to tend to. Cleo sauntered over to the doorframe and lazily pressed one of the buttons on the wall. I heard clicks above my head and realized I was being lifted up. The harness that held me tightened through the chair's frame at multiple points to prevent my escape. In seconds, my feet were off the floor, the winch hoisting me into the air. The action was fluid and effortless. I wasn't the first person to take this ride. I've designed this little contraption myself. It lets me transport cattle from room to room. Minimizes the mess and the chance for escape, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Just hang tight and relax. You're doing great. The next room was clinical and sterile. White tiled walls and the flickering glow of fluorescent lights. I hung like a shoulder of beef next to two naked, butchered bodies. I could tell one was a frail and lanky looking woman, the meat barely clinging to her bones. The other was a man, and I recognized those tattoos. Vincent hung next to me, very dead, his eye staring ahead at nothing. <laughs> Cleo stopped in front of me, one hand resting on her hip. The tight, black tie dress made a stark contrast to the slaughterhouse aesthetic of the room. She smiled and gestured towards the man on the rack with her wine glass. I'll have you know, your friend here was not as willing a participant. He made the ill-fated decision to piss on my assistant while we were stringing him up. Quite a mess, actually. I made sure that would never happen again. Quick flick of the wrist, as they say. <laughs> Saved by the bell. Why don't you think about that while I assist this customer? I wouldn't get any ideas if I were you. For your own sake. As soon as she left the room, I began to struggle against my bindings, testing their give. I was trapped. 
I looked at Vincent, making the mistake of casting my eyes down. My stomach lurched as I corroborated Cleo's story. Cleo returned to the room. A quiet hipster trailed behind her, listening intently as Cleo waved her arm in my direction. She was advertising the fresh stock. These are the freshest cuts available for your enjoyment. As you know, we gather and produce the finest quality meats in the tri-state area. Free range, of course. Uh, well, I'm in the market for, uh... Uh, well... Remind me again, Earl, what are you working on these days? Sure, uh... uh, How about the live one over there? He pointed towards me, but Cleo shook her head. Earl... Uh, That's a bit beyond your price point. Perhaps something else? Oh, yeah, uh, right. Um... (sighs) Earl... Yeah? What have you been working on lately? Tacos. Just tacos? Tacos are very trendy right now. I see. Last I checked, you were working on sliders. Did they not turn out well? Oh, yeah, man, those sliders were not great. More fat than flavor, honestly. Hard sell at the restaurant. I see. Personally, I thought you'd have a way with the product. Your restaurant comes so highly rated. Guess you might just not have the skill needed to cook this. All right then, if I can't handle the product you gave me previously and you were making a taco, what would you use? That's simple. I would get you some boneless thigh meat from that rack behind me. It's a little tougher, so make sure you tenderize it, but it should be a great fit for tacos. How does that sound? Uh, yeah, sure. That sounds great. Splendid. Follow me. She led the customer out of the room, returning moments later to slide on a rubber smock and gather her tools. She opened a large refrigerator door along the side wall and pulled a large chunk of raw meat from it. She began to carve. The sounds of her knife slicing through the gore were intense and wet. Each cut drove my mind into a deeper frenzy. I struggled and pulled at my bindings again, desperately trying to muffle the sounds of the chains against my pull. Until Cleo pointed her knife at me. You know I'm surprised you're struggling so much. If you actually valued your life, you wouldn't have tried poking your nose where it didn't belong. Now, I need to focus on my fillet. Stay quiet. Fixed upon her blade, I fell silent as she finalized her client's order. She wrapped the meat in butcher paper and pulled a sticker to seal the pack. Opening the door, she handed over the horrific package to Earl. The two exchanged more pleasantries about marinades for the meat as Earl marched up the basement steps. Cleo took another long draw of her red wine and then turned her attention towards poor Vincent. She grimaced with pleasure as she butchered cuts of meat off his carcass. Her mouth was stained with wine, and it made her look like a wolf hunched over its kill. I couldn't turn away and stared in awe as she filleted the body piece by piece. What was once a man, my friend, was now packaged and divided into coolers. Even the organs were prepped and labeled. Within the hour, every last part of the body was processed and put away. But she wasn't done. She had another body to process and began to work on the female body that hung next to me. 
Pushing the button on the winch, she lowered the body to a rolling cart. Cleo looked over the meat before her and shook her head. Mm. Filthy addict. You may be too spoiled for sale. Looks like you studied for a drug test. Even if I offered Earl a discount to use you for some food experiment, I personally don't want the reputation of killing him or his customers with whatever you've pushed through your system. Perhaps I can just practice my knife work and see what's salvageable. Or I could work on the new stock. No, the fun can wait. I need to dispose of this first. Cleo began working on the woman's body. Letting her knives do the talking, she easily slid the tip beneath the skin, cutting around certain points until she started articulating the joints. She wedged her blade into the sockets, popping them out of place to remove the limbs. My mind was racing, thinking on how I was going to escape this nightmare situation. There were few options. I was still bound by the wrists, suspended a few feet above the floor. Cleo took a pause to admire her handiwork and grabbed her wine glass, smearing it with blood before draining the last sip. That's when my stroke of luck appeared. No, oh, damn. End of the bottle. Don't struggle too much against your bindings. I don't want you to bruise or the iron content will settle into the skin. Be a good boy, and I'll be back in just a second to take care of you. This glass won't fill itself. As the doors closed, I shifted my weight and started to rock back and forth. Lifting as much as I could off the chair, I tried to throw my body weight down hard against the bindings holding me aloft. One, two, three times, and then I felt a shift as the mechanism failed. Two strokes of luck, actually. I dropped to the floor. With the lift chair broken, my restrictive harness was loose enough to slip free. As I removed the bindings, I tried not to look at the blood-slick surface of the cart. I didn't really want to see what was left of the woman over on Cleo's butcher counter. I glanced around the room, taking in the gore, the knives, the stainless steel surfaces. If I was a secret agent, I'm sure I would have had plenty of time to concoct an elaborate plan. But I'm just me and I could already hear Cleo coming back. Before she could realize I'd slipped my bindings, I sprung up from behind the table and checked the bitch. Ha! Uh. I ran up the stairs, hard and heavy, like my life depended on it. I reached the top of the stairs and immediately got dizzy. Which way had I come in? Where was the front door? I turned left, why not, and ran down the hall, thinking I recognized some of the paintings I'd seen in the front of the house. Up ahead, a door. Salvation. Or so I thought. I burst through into a well-appointed parlor to find it full of people. Waitstaff walked to and fro, distributing glasses of champagne. People sat in small clusters, beautiful couples perusing menus. There were a lot of wide eyes and shocked faces as I burst through the door. I realized I recognized some faces. Business leaders, the local news. I even saw the mayor in the background somewhere. A blunt object connected with my right knee signaling the end of my flight. Cleo certainly knew her way around a nine iron. <laughs> oh, you'll fetch a pretty penny, you'll see. Good night, meat. <sighs> I... 
came out of my daze and was back at the bar. Vincent once again sat across from me with the same wild look he'd had earlier that night. Here are 10,000 reasons. I'll pay you five up front and the rest after. It'll be an easy job for you. You keep watch, I go in, I come out, easy, scouts on it. This has to be a dream. No fucking way. I don't care if you have a million dollars. I'm not going back to that house. I'm getting out of here. What the hell? I opened the door to a pitch black void. The dark sucking away any light escaping past the open bar door in my hand. <laughs> you should have said no the first time, Lindsay. Now you're staring out into the void just like I did. <laughs> you should see the look on your face. Priceless. What did you do? Whatever you did to this place, change it back. <laughs> I can. I wish I could. You see, we're both dead. Dead? Well, technically, you're dying. Cleo is doing a number on you. She's selling you bit by bit. No, that's not true. Oh, 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 it is. <laughs> listen, if you if you listen closely, you can hear a carving. Wait. What? Why are we here in the bar then? This is the afterlife? In theory, yes, but in practice this is only the last bits of your consciousness firing. Everyone fades away as their blood lets out. Fading into an inky black void only to be recycled anew. Everyone, at some point, will be forgotten. <laughs> I ran through the kitchen, out the back of the bar and into the blackness of the void. At first, everything appeared to be fine, just an emptiness closing in around me. And then, as light filtered in at the edges of my vision, I started to wake, regaining consciousness, flat on my back, on top of a cold, silver work table. The tip of Cleo's blade piercing my skin and slicing me up. A pair of bloody hands carved into my body, sectioning it off piece by piece, and I wished to hell I was back in the void. My body was alive with pain and raw nerve endings. I turned my head and sure enough, Cleo towered over me, effortlessly butchering my carcass. My joints made sickening sounds as they were popped out of place with a quick twist of her blade. I watched helplessly as parts of me were being ripped out, packaged and set aside. Knowing this was the end, I let my mind drift back to my friend. I should have never agreed to meet up with Vincent in the first place. Crazy bastard. A vision of him appeared in my mind, standing behind Cleo, just watching and shaking his head as she continued to carve. In my last moments, I raised my remaining appendage and flipped him the bird as my consciousness faded away into pain and darkness. Thank you.
This is unacceptable. Over two hours late now. Tardiness is one thing that drives me nuts, especially when all I have in the fridge are a few bits of dried up celery and some out of date hummus. Someone is going to pay. The window frames rattle, rain pounds against the road, and it all adds to my frustration as I shuffle across the carpet, arms folded in silent protest. This bloody weather. Unacceptable. For three goddamn weeks, we've had this rain and wind. And as soon as I open the door to the pesky delivery guy, winter will steal all the warmth from the house. <sighs> What's his name? Brian, is it? Hm. Nice enough for a menial worker. But it took me ages to clean all the muddy footprints he marched down the hallway last time. For Christ's sake, where are you, Brian? The sooner you finish, the sooner you can return to your cheap-ass beer and shitty sitcoms. This is absolutely unacceptable. Hello? Yes, I'm waiting for a delivery. Number 16, Alpaca Crescent, due two hours ago. Yes, I know there's water on the roads. Why? Is he coming by boat? Don't put me on hold, don't you- Bish, she put me on hold. My jaw clicks back into place. I must have been grinding my teeth again. What? Still three more ahead of me? What time will that be? For fuck's sake. There's a new supermarket chain opening on the other estate next week. I might give those a try if they deliver. Christ, I might even be desperate enough to drive to the store myself if not. <sighs> the thought of it, though. I can't abide breathing in the same oxygen as the other day creatures. And after dusk, an even more terrifying breed of people starts popping up. Drive to the store myself. Here I go again. Who am I trying to kid? A hopeful agoraphobic. There are still a couple of letters on the sideboard that need to go over to number 19. They've been there days now. And I can't bring myself to march just a couple of doors down and stick them in his mailbox. Someone might see me. Attempt to engage in conversation. The thought of it. Even worse, what if he came out? His name is John, according to the letters. <laughs> I made the mistake of feeling brave one night, wheeling the bins out before midnight. I caught him, John, staring at me from underneath the street light, eyeing me up and down from head to toe and back again. He gave me the chills. Do what you like behind closed doors is my motto, though. The motto of any agoraphobic, I guess. I've become even more insulated since they let me work from home. I wouldn't have it any other way, though. I hate people. Hate them all. Floating around in their bubbles of superficiality. Bouncing their negative energy from one to the next. The doctor said you never really do get over it. Agoraphobia, that is. I made the joke once that coming out about it would surely help. He gave me a prescription and the name of a specialist that doesn't do house visits. Fuck it. If I don't go out, I don't need the medication. There are other things on the list too, but I choose to ignore them one at a time. Happy enough in my own little world. An engine. That's definitely an engine. Arms still folded, hairs bristling on my neck. I march to the living room window and peer through the blurry raindrops. I see a van turning the corner, but it's different from the one that usually comes. Just white, no shop logo. Perhaps the main van broke down. That's why it's all running late. I don't like change. It's unacceptable. Thrumming my fingers against the windowsill, I 
watch the driver outside. Shit, I don't think it's Brian. My fingers begin to tingle, and my stomach churns in that familiar way. This is not acceptable. He ducks behind the back of the van, and once the door opens, he's gone. My palms are sweaty. I hold my breath and wait for him to reappear. There he is, dressed in jeans, a gigantic leather jacket, and glasses so dark I wonder how he can see anything. Christ, this guy is built like a brick shit house. I watch his huge balloon hands begin working at the locks. Oh, this is no good at all. I could pretend to be out, but I'm so hungry. And besides, the car is parked in the driveway. Lousy planning on my part, that. I'll never let it happen again. The ramp goes down, and Jacket effortlessly begins dragging the loaded dolly down the walk. I miss Brian and his normal-sized shoes. The feet on this guy are world record territory. Shit. What do I say to him? Hi, man. How's it hanging? Nice shades. Who did you kill today? Fuck. He's halfway down the path. I step away from the window and hover in the archway, biting at my cuticles, swallowing down the metallic offering. Blood pulsates in my ears as I wait for the inevitable knock. There it is, and as predicted, it feels like someone bringing a hammer to my brain. I take a deep breath and wrap my fingers around the cold handle. I'll tell him to leave the bags there. I'll sign, and he'll be on his way. Rather get soaked than let this thug into my house. I open the door, and without a word, he pushes by, dragging the loaded dolly over the sacred threshold and lurching towards the kitchen leaving a small trail of red in his wake. What the fuck? I open my mouth, but close it again. This man is a mountain, only a tiny gap between his shoulders and the hallway walls. My eyes drift from him back to the trail. The meat! It must have defrosted in the time it left the depot. This is not acceptable! He thrusts the paperwork at me without even a grunt. No apology, nothing. Right, that's it. I'm furious. I'll be contacting customer service. Heads will roll. I sign the docket and hand it back with a smile. Where's Brian? Not sure. I'm just filling in today. He begins unpacking the bags onto the kitchen table, splashing blood all over the upholstered chairs and checkered tiles. All that meat is probably already ruined. It even smells off. I fumble the phone from my pocket, intending to take a photograph and attach it as evidence to a very snotty email that I'll write as soon as Jacket leaves. Someone is going to pay for this cock up. I need to get a shot with the delivery guy in it, so they can't worm out of it, claiming sabotage. Hovering over the nearest bag, I take my chance and discreetly pull the plastic to one side. There's no warning, no time to prepare. The explosion of vomit is instant. And as I heave up stringy celery onto tiles that I only cleaned this morning, one thought repeats in my head as the image of human feet tied up with string embeds itself in my mind for eternity. This is not acceptable. Something wrong? I retch again, but this time, only a watery green liquid emerges. I spit as much of it out as I can, but the remaining taste lingers in my mouth. I think there's been a mistake. As I straighten myself, the guy raises an eyebrow and begins checking through the docket. To try and stop the room from spinning, I focus on a droplet of rain that makes its way down his big round forehead towards the inch-long scar above his right eyebrow. I can feel my stomach churn. It doesn't help. 
The size of the guy's arm makes the folds of the brim plastic bag tucked under it look like his marble collection. As he licks his thumb and turns the page, one of the spherical shaped objects drops to the floor, but doesn't bounce or roll. It simply lands with a softness that sends a shudder down my aching spine. It's looking at me. It's fucking looking at me. Against the starkness of the white tile, I study the eyeball, a network of red veins threading across the white, but running short of the purity surrounding the green. It reminds me of an unlit neon sign, but it's not. It's a fucking eyeball. A fucking eyeball. Reality kicks in, and I take a step back, my heart thumping against its cage. My legs feel weak, unstable, and I'm half surprised they still work. At least three eyes are looking at me, two behind Jacket's large black shades, one at his feet. But goodness knows how many more in the bag. And the feet in the bag. What is- It's all here. I checked it twice before I left. A bead of blood begins to run from his right nostril towards his lip. There's a giant in my kitchen and an eyeball on my floor. Cool lyrics, but what the fuck is happening here? Is this a panic attack? Is my mind playing tricks? Some Alice in Wonderland on crack scenario? Time to get the medication topped up. A sharp pain runs up my spine as I connect with the kitchen counter. Coiling my fingers around the bench top, I cling on for dear life. But I really want to get off this ride now. Your... your nose! He puts the bag down and snakes a thin arm across his face. Hello? Who the fuck is this? A white rabbit? I hear the wiping of feet and the click of the door. Come the fuck in then! Get rid of them. But I can't move. My legs have finally checked out. Besides, the uninvited guest is already thundering down the hallway. This is unacceptable. Footsteps close in. I hold my breath. John? It's John from number 19. What is- Oh, your door was open. Both Jacket and I look towards him, following his eyes to the floor, to the eye on the floor. There's a rusty number six in his left hand. I recognize it as the one from my mailbox. In his right hand are the letters, his letters. The ones that were on the sideboard. I think there's been a mix up. Jacket looks back towards me and back at John. John looks towards me and back at the eye on the floor. Is this not number 19? <sighs> his sigh carries weight and adds a heaviness to the already unbearable tension. Pinching the weathered base between his index finger and thumb, he lifts the number towards Jacket, displaying it as a nine, but letting it slide into the intended six. Blasted weather causing havoc. Why is everyone so calm when there's an eye on the floor? The eye. John tugs at his pants and crouches to the floor. He picks up the eyeball and holds it out in front of him as he did with the rusty number and just as casually. Rolling it between his fingers, he holds it to his nose and gives it a sniff. No, no way. He didn't just do that. It's in his fucking mouth. My grip tightens on the bench top as he begins to chew. My stomach gives a flutter, but there's nothing left to emerge. And all I can offer is a dry wretch into my bonsai. Oh shit, oh shit. I can hear it crunching between his teeth. I can imagine the gooey content spilling into the back of his throat. This is not acceptable. Where's my regular guy? Sick. I'm on meat usually. This is not acceptable. I want more than a club discount after this. I want nothing more than to be outside, breathing in the fresh air. With his hands on his hips, John stares at where the eye used to be. <sighs> Can't get the staff these days. He slowly lifts his head, exposing a bead of magnificent red running from his nose over his top lip. 
bringing his tongue across to collect. He looks me up and down, the same way he did under the street light. I've got a plastic sheet in the van. And my tools. Fresh is best. Chop Shop. Written by Tori Miller. With performances by Jeff Clement as Lindsay, Alastair Mackey as Vincent, Christina Lewis as Cleo, and Graham Rowett as Earl. Convenient Shopping was written by Mark Taus, with performances by Ewan Chung as Mark, Brandon Green as Jacket, and Graham Ruitt as John. Todd's Teardown was written by Michael Zenke, featuring performances by Alistair Mackey as Todd, Graham Ruitt as the Demon Foreman, and myself, Jason Wilson, as the Warden. Musical composition was by J.M. Scherf. Episode artwork, web development, and creative direction by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon management by Brooks Bigley. Videography by Hale Scherf. Audio engineering and sound design was by me, Jason Wilson. So thanks for joining us on our first preseason episode of season four. I hope your stomachs can handle what's to come. (laughs) The team and I have some fun stories in store for you. And don't worry, we'll be back on Halloween to open another season four door. And we may have a few other things in store for you between now and then. And if you'd like more info on that, keep an eye on our social or join our patrons on Patreon to get the inside scoop and the first peek of what's to come. Speaking of our patrons, we would also like to take the time to thank our patrons once again and to any of those who have taken the time to leave us a five-star rating and a review. Those reviews keep us on the top of the charts and it makes it easier for more twisted souls to find the show. So special thanks to our patrons. Aaron Anthony, Allison Chains, Amy Nikolai, Arthur Unk, Colton Quickle, Danny Garraway, Danny the Spoon Lord, Doozer Pendan, Ellie Dowell, Ellen Houghton, Emily Cullen, Eric Pritchard, Eric Phones, Evan Jaffe, Jackal Bot Snows, Jason Porras, Jeremiah Overstreet, Joanna Walker, Julianne Reether, Karina Sanina, Kay Davis, Kelly Bear, Klaus H., Kyle Wilcox, Laura Lupinetti, Lynn Browning, Mesa, Megan Pruitt, Michael Velez, Mitch Garretts, Molotov Was Taken, Michael Philip B.G., Niels Garuppa, Paige Pye, Paik Carey, Patrick Stewart, Philip Akey, Plin Plin Plon, All Night Long, Ramius, Ronan Kumori, Ryzan the Mad, Sandy King Carpenter, Sean Geary, Serena Eli, Spirit Live, Talicia Gallman, Teresa Tabor, Undisputed Baron of Disneyland, Zektros Vraskul Shaktolas. I'm pretty sure I just said something. Bridget Criswell, Melissa Robertson. The Grey Rooms is also streaming free on Spotify. Just get the Spotify app or open the browser and search The Grey Rooms. And we here at The Grey Rooms love our fans, and we always want to give back to you in the best way we know how. We have a lot of fun things to show you, and we hope you like it. You can find out more by joining us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, YouTube, Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all of the tortured souls who have passed through the rooms. Our emotional support group is always looking to help you with all of your needs. And let's not forget about our merch store. It's full of epic designs and logos for you to sport, showing the world you are a survivor of these very rooms. All of this and more can be found in the show notes or on our website at thegrayrooms.com. And let's not forget about our Discord channel. It is growing and there's a lot going on over there. We're talking about, we play games, we write stories, we help each other with our editing processes. Patrons get to watch behind the scenes editing of the stories. If you're not there, you're missing out. 
check us out today on Discord, the Grey Rooms, obviously, and just see what exactly it is that you are missing. And also, patrons, now that we're in the roll, I can get caught up on those patron packets I'm behind on. <laughs> Thanks for your support. And for all of you out there, thank you for supporting the show like you do. With that being said, we have a ton of work left to do. So we will see you in a few weeks. <laughs>